lessons and the advertising in particular that was geared towards this particular group of women, as I mentioned. So what I will be doing tonight is um, talking a little bit about historical context. Um, looking, we'll be looking very specifically at some of these advertisements and ingredients, of course, which is very important. And then we'll be looking at you know, the intersection, if you think about the Gilded Age and the progressive era in America and the turn of the 20th century and the changing, you know, physicality of the United States from rural to urban and everything that comes along with that. Um, Certainly, uh, I will be reading excerpts um, from this work, which, which is not yet published. I would like to mention that, um, but it is in progress, so that's important. Um, so what I want to start with is um, a very short video overview of what constitutes my introductory um, information uh, in the first chapter. Um, so it's not quite finished, but I would like to share that with you now. A changing landscape, more ways than one. The American landscape from 1800 to 1900 is one of dramatic transformation in both geography and ideology. Expansion westward in the United States facilitated the introduction of 29 new states to the Union throughout this period alone and a staggering increase in population fostered the growth of commercial cities and eventually buzzing industrial centers. The expanding political, social, and economic doctrines of the era were regularly scrutinized, making way for a re-examination of democracy at every available opportunity. Advancements in science and technology created a system of continuous mass production that led to new approaches in advertising and the birth of the mail order house for the marketing and distribution of goods throughout the country. Although temporarily interrupted by the American Civil War from 1861 through 1865, most Americans by century's end had access to an unimaginable array of products and services and a growing middle class formed largely during the last half of the 19th century sought security, style, and comfort in their lives. These factors combined contributed to the rapid growth and development of the nation at an unprecedented rate, a process that had both constructive and destructive consequences. While the study of populations depends heavily on measurement and estimation techniques, the American population increased from about 4 million persons in 1790, when the first federal census of the United States was employed, to almost 107 million persons in 1920. These share numbers alone seemed overwhelming However, the systematic pattern of values that developed among the populace are equally compelling. The 19th century, particularly after the end of the Civil War, was a period that gave rise to nationalism, religious fervor, and a purely unique sense of American individualism. These components worked interchangeably with one another to enhance awareness in the American mind that is, an awareness of politics, societal obligation, and economic opportunity. From this awareness emerged the entrepreneur, the self-made man, or, in a few cases, woman, who, with just the right conditions on which to capitalize, could accumulate a small fortune. In a society where one possessed or aspired to middle-class respectability, material prosperity was not only a clear mark of success, 
but evidence of virtue as compared to poverty and failure as a symptom of vice. Of course, there were other nuances and norms that determined success and status, primarily those of race and gender. 19th century women were held to standards clearly defined in the cult of true womanhood, attitudes that associated true or more blatant good women with home, family, and domesticity. According to historian Jean Boydston, I quote, in their homes, presumably safely guarded from the sullying influences of business and political affairs, women effortlessly directed their households and exerted a serene moral influence over their husbands and children. By both temperament and ability, so custom had it, women were ill-suited to hard labor, to the rough and tumble of political life, or the competitive individualism of the industrial economy. Now, while the prescription for the true woman was clearly defined to include piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity, certain behavioral characteristics were expected of men as well who enjoyed substantial social standing, such as sobriety, diligence, reliability, and a responsible work ethic. There are few better examples of the entrepreneurial spirit than that which is captured in the 19th century patent medicine industry. However, the practices associated with the industry, coupled with the products it manufactured, present ideals in stark contrast to those that dictated the social mores of the last quarter of the 19th century. Patent medicines were readily available and certainly not limited to the newly emerging urban centers. In many rural areas, doctors were scarce. Therefore, the elixir salesmen found a viable outlet for the variety of remedies they peddled. The mere fact that morphine was a major ingredient of the potion more than likely made man, woman, or child feel quite better after consumption, no matter what the ailment. In that regard, the medicines really worked. And while advertisers focused on women as the target audience for their products, even louder voices called upon women to purify the industry. In the traditional and nuclear family, of that particular time, women were the likely administrator of the remedy and not unlikely is the assumption that they followed their maternal instincts and kept ample supplies of patent medicines on hand for they were indeed a great blessing to women. Okay, so there is the historical context. Um, the United States, certainly uh, by the last quarter of the 19th century post-Civil War, has changed dramatically in terms of physicality, uh, westward expansion. Certainly we've moved largely from a rural to an urban landscape. The 1896 election, um, which I included one of the um, images of the uh, McKinley um, uh, propaganda, the McKinley um, uh, campaign uh, um, a poster, um, really was symbolic of this idea that simple, traditional, rural America um, was largely um, uh, being surpassed, and it was being surpassed by urban, metropolitan, industrial 
America. And so when we look at um, certain groups, when we look at um, behaviors and activities, um, and when we look at uh, economic activity in particular, as we will see with the example of the patent medicine industry, um, it's important, you know, certainly to acknowledge that this study is focused in one particular area. And so when I do conclude with some final thoughts, I do want to present to you because this, this is one, one uh, area of study that could go in several different directions. And oftentimes I would find myself thinking, wow, well, this is interesting. And I would, you know, look at other, other areas areas. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize that I was very focused on the advertisements themselves uh, and uh, the um, prescribed behaviors and standards for women of a particular socioeconomic group and class, um, and obviously race at that particular time. So with that said, I want to move forward um, and share some of that information with you. And I will reinforce it um, with some um, uh, direct reading from the chapters that have been um, uh, complete. And I also want to reinforce what Steffi and Suzanne had requested. If you have any questions, please feel to put them in the, um, in the chat. I will have an open Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. So I will gladly address any questions that you might have if you would like to ask them instead of putting them in the chat. So um, obviously, you know, we could go into <laughs> many different um, uh, areas when we talk about the history of medicine. Um, I just want to reinforce the fact that the 19th century is often considered this, you know, golden age of medicine. If you think of the onset of the 19th century, the early 1800s, there is still, of course, um, uh, the practice of heroic medicine, you know, which involves bleeding and purging. Um, but as transitions and changes took place throughout the 19th century, um, there were many alternatives that emerged to heroic uh, medicine. And of course, thankfully so, because uh, bleeding and purging is, of course, not only is it not effective, um, it certainly, you know, isn't enjoyable. Um, so if you look at some of these practices, they really reflect some of those transitions I alluded to. You know, electricity, um, uh, electric properties being effective um, ways to um, uh, resolve medical issues, effective ways for treatments, mesmerism. You know, certainly you get, you know, the emergence of these kind of, you know, uh, um, we have uh, periods of religious revival, but spirituality and the laying of healing hands in order to uh, realign some of the fluids in the bodies in the body to um, address you know what uh, the ailment what one particular ailment is hydrotherapy immersing people in water now interestingly enough if we think of hydrotherapy um, you know it, it is making people cleaner <laughs> so um, being immersed in baths and using water um, is somewhat effective too. And then of course we get to homeopathic, that desire to use small amounts of drugs in order to treat particular ailments in a variety of ways. Now, with the onset of homo homeopathic um, uh, approaches to medicine, and if you think of you know the advent of the mail order catalog and this idea that um, uh, access to a doctor may be not just scarce, as I mentioned in that short video, but impossible in some cases, not to mention the fact, you know, we can even look at the medical profession during that particular time um, and the requirements for doctors and to, for people to become doctors. Um, but there is an increased desire for home rem remedies. And that increased desire for home remedies uh, leads us to the patent medicine industry. So this 
reference in and of itself is misleading, the patent. So if you read, um, of course, you know, how we define the definition of a patent, a governmental protection, assuring the inventor the exclusive right of manufacturing, using, exploiting, and selling an invention. The Patent and Trademark Office of the United States was established early on in 1790. But what really constituted a patent medicine prior to 1906? And remember, 1906 is a key year for a very specific reason. For the most part, it's the package, it's the packaging, it is the bottle, it is the label, it is the trademark. Because the patent itself did not require one to disclose the ingredients. So the idea that Dr. So-and-so had this secret remedy that would cure anything and cure everything was quite common. Now, as people became more familiar uh, with different ingredients and the idea that different ingredients were extremely, you know, advantageous or helpful or had, you know, these curing properties, of course, um, they were happy to disclose ingredients, as we will see on the label, but were not required to do so as a result of the patent. If you think about, you know, um, something like westward expansion, there, you know, there tends to be a fascination uh, with the unknown or with what has, you know, one has limited understanding or limited knowledge of, you know, so you get this the rattlesnake oil king's liniment, um, and here, of course, we have a bottle that is, you know. Um, uh, emphasizing this is absolute alcohol, 83% absolute alcohol. There is a fascination with Native American practices. There is a fascination, um, you know, as Native Americans are being forced onto reservations in the last quarter of the 19th century at a much quicker rate, um, concentrated reservations throughout the United States. Um, there also is uh, on the part of the advertisers and those who are marketing their product, um, uh, the desire to capitalize on this fascination as we see here with the Kickapoo doctor and the advertisement that accompanies it. Patent medicines were um, promoted, uh, had a variety of names, the nostrums, the elixirs, the panaceas, the cure-alls, and the paragoric. And if you look at some of the packaging, and this is one thing that really struck me as I began to look at the total package, meaning the bottle, the box, and the marketing materials that went along with it, not just in the form of advertisements and the popular press, but things that were passed out to promote it. Something like these trade, you know, they become trade cards, uh, 19th century trade, uh, um, uh, later 19th century trade cards. In this case, Dr. Morse's Indian root pills. And if you can see, it has this little ditty, a, com a tomcat sat on a backyard fence with an aching heart and a soul intense, rigged out in style in every sense, immense. He was musing upon his lonely lot and said to himself, she cometh not. What a terrible heartache I have got, great Scott. And then, of course, this is the best family pill in use, and it is for sale everywhere. So these are collectible. Paragoric. Um, you get a lot of bang for your buck out of paragoric. As you can see here, the alcohol content is quite high. It's 92 proof. It contains opium and morphine. And if you look at the dosage for a child five days old, it's five drops, two weeks old, eight drops, five years old, 25 drops, and an adult, one teaspoonful. Um, so, you know, this is of course being administered to, um, to infants, um, newborns. And um, in many instances, we know sometimes um, it's not that less is more, there is a desire for more to be more. 
Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound. Uh, this is one example of a very profitable enterprise. Now, as you'll see when I read one um, short excerpt, Lydia herself um, uh, was long gone by the time her family really profited uh, from her vegetable compound. It was a cure-all. It was very much focused towards women, promoted as um, uh, to cure all that ails the female, and again, touted as the greatest remedy in the world. Um, uh, it's Lydia's son who will uh, make a tremendous amount of money off of Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound. But the marketing and the advertising itself is really rooted in you know, her name and how they promote Lydia Lydia Pinkham, her image and her name, encouraging people and women in particular, of course, women who purchase her product to write to Lydia and let that let her know of, you know, the fabulous properties and um, your experience of using Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound and that she will write back to you. And in fact, she did, except that um, Lydia herself was dead. So we'll see when the muck get a hold of this, what happens. This is one of my favorites, Dr. Harder's Bitters. And again, I'm not going to read this little ditty, but you can see it starts Maiden of the Golden Hair, uh, Blythe and Sweet and Passing Fair. So again, this very Victorian image. But the interesting thing about this um, trade card, this promotional material, is it had a little note and it said, hold to the light in that little ditty, if you see right here after where they are and what they see, if perchance they are of me. Now hold to the light. And there you have Dr. Harder's The Only True Iron Tonic, which beautifies the complexion and purifies the blood. So it can be used internally and externally. And this brings us to Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup the tagline of which makes them lay like the dead till morning. So if you look, of course, at uh, this little bottle that we have here of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup that was promoted to help um, with children teething first and foremost, um, but of course, babies crying to calm a crying baby. Um, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup was 50% morphine. In this bottle, if you look, it's relatively small. I'm just going to jump back because look at the, the bottle that she's holding in her, in her hands. So you can see this is not a, a, a large bottle. Sodium carbonate, which is washing soda. That's a little different than baking soda. Aqua. Um, as I looked at different recipes and my sabbatical research took me to places like the Hagley Museum in Delaware, um, uh, the Waring Historical Library in Charleston, South Carolina, um, I came across, especially at the, at the Waring in um, Charleston, I came across um, uh, some recipe books. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, these recipe books were um, from uh, plantations. And so some of these remedies, you can certainly um, uh, suggest that some of these remedies are um, rooted in African American um, uh, remedies and treatments and so on and so forth. And they're documented in some of these um, plantation, you know, recipe books. But Aqua, which is in essence just water, obviously. Um, you know, we have aqua rose, which has the the um, the smell of a rose, a more perfumey, and then different types of spices that would be assigned as aqua this or aqua rosemary, so on and so forth. Um, but in essence, it's just you know uh, water. And again, some more of those images. And then Dr. Kilmore, Kilmore's female remedy. Um, so I'm going to read you this uh, verbatim from my research because this is where I got the reference, the great, uh, a great blessing to women. Dr. Kilmer's rallying call was to mothers, wives, and daughters. 
If you value good health and hope for a long life, use female remedy. Mothers, give it to your weak and delicate daughters. Not a drop of impure blood can escape its healing and purifying influence. Dr. Kilmer's female remedy was advertised as a great blessing to women and promised youthful bloom and beauty to all who consumed it. And again, it's reinforced here by the imagery. Um, yeah. Cosmetics uh, are one area that is off topic a bit, but very similar, obviously. Um, this is Dr. Campbell's safe arsenic complexion wafers. Um, arsenic and uh, mercury in particular, women um, ingested mercury. Uh, mercury was considered um, uh, to be uh, a way to um, have access to contraception. Um, it oftentimes as well um, was used in those drugs that uh, were abortifacient drugs. Um, and so uh, women ingesting mercury was not uncommon. Common. Bayer Pharmaceuticals, um, as you know, along with this um, groundbreaking medicine that we know as aspirin, they also got on the um, uh, into heroin, um, and uh, heroin was used regularly in cough medicines. And so here you have Bayer, the sedative for coughs, uh, and. When we look at the ingredients, you know, we, we're, I think we tend to look at these ingredients through our contemporary lens, you know, how we view drugs, opiates, morphine, so on and so forth. Um, this is a letter that I came across at the Hagley Museum and the business records, and um, they had a great collection regarding the opium trade. And so this is 1866, and this is an individual who is trying to make an introduction for a business relationship. There are two young men. Um, they've been in the habit of importing opium through uh, you know, parties in New York, and they're not quite satisfied. So they're looking at another for another source source of opium. And, you know, I went through, oh my goodness, I mean, there were just, you know, hundreds of letters uh, dealing with the opium trade um, in the last quarter of the 19th century, last half of the 19th century. So that takes us to this conflict. And the conflict um, with respect to the ingredients in the patent medicine industry, uh, pat patent medicines themselves, uh, the advertising strategies, uh, marketing um, uh, uh, practices, and the goals and objectives and the mission of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And uh, here you have one of the founding members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Frances Willard, and uh, the symbolic white bow. And the membership, by the turn of the 20th century, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is the largest women's organization in the world. It's not just limited, of course, to the United States. And so at this time, I would like to just read you um, a short excerpt here from my research uh, where I make this connection between the industry and then the goals and the mission of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. November 1874, Cleveland, Ohio. Mrs. Annie Wittenmeyer, Miss Frances Willard, Mrs. Mary Johnson, and Mrs. Mary Ingham are elected the first officers of the newly founded National Women's Christian Temperance Union. Their slogan, for God and home and native land, that was later charged to change, excuse me, to every land. Their goal, total abstinence from alcohol and eventually tobacco and other drugs as well. A bow made of white ribbons symbolized their crusade. It was a woman's crusade, deeply rooted in purity and the maxims, agitate, edu educate and legislate. That's what characterized their efforts. 
as far as protests go, that of the Women's Christian Temperance Union would come to be one of the most successful in American history. And the organization itself quickly became not only the largest organization in the United States, but in the world. At the time of its founding, women lacked rights, the right to vote, property rights, and even the custodial right of their children, their own children in cases of divorce. There were few legal protections for women and they were largely excluded from the political sphere. There were clearly defined behaviors that characterized good women. They were pious, pure, submissive, and their virtue was rooted in domesticity. This was the cult of true womanhood. It was simply unacceptable for an upstanding middle to upper class woman to visit the local saloon. And yet, at the end of the 19th century, Americans had spent over a billion dollars on alcoholic beverages each year, compared to 900 million on meat and less than 200 million on public education. That's directly from the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The cult of true womanhood did not necessarily preclude activism, however, and while women's activism might appear contradictory to the principles that comprise the ideology, women were certainly able to carve out a new occupation for themselves by the end of the 19th century, that of social reformer. Under the leadership of Frances Willard, the second president of the Women's Christian emphasis was placed on moral persuasion to achieve abstinence. Excuse me, Jackie. Could we ask everyone to mute, please? Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Under the leadership of Frances Willard, the second president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, emphasis was placed on moral persuasion to achieve abstinence. This philosophy would eventually collide with the birth of the progressive era in America. And like Willard, the advocates of progressivism professed that all reform was interconnected and social problems could not necessarily be separated. It makes sense then that in addition to many other causes, the Women's Christian Temperance Union would eventually take up the mantle of women's suffrage in 1894. However, it was temperance that remained the foundation of the organization. In the words of Frances Willard, temperance is moderation in the things that are good and total abstinence in the things that are foul. The fruits of their labor would be realized first in the 1919 Volstead or National Prohibition Act, and ultimately in the ratification of the 18th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States in 1920, which prohibited the manufacture, transport, and sale of intoxicating liquors in the United States. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union um, is in a bit of a fix, so to speak, or certainly um, uh, has a challenge before them with respect to um, alcohol and other substances as they are uh, contained in patent medicines. Now, I made mention of the progressive era in America. And so we're talking about roughly this period of 1890 to 1920. Some might argue that the progressive era ended with uh, the onset of World War I. Others would say it went into 1920 with, of course, ratification of the 18th and the 19th Amendments. But progressive uh, progressivism I don't like to use the word movement, the progressive movement, because progressivism has you know, two prongs. It is a social reform movement and a political party. Now, some would argue that from the social reform movement perspective, it's the birth of modern political liberalism as we come to know it, because the progressives um, are 
you know, attempting to put pressure on the government for legislation, for change, even going as far as trying to legislate morality, which is very controversial, um, but, you know, then and now. Um, but, you know, certainly at the same time, this notion that we get, you know, the advent or the birth of our first social scientists, those who are looking at um, the problems that are plaguing society, those that are looking, people like Jacob Reese, of course, as we know, how the other half lives and, you know, investigating the urban poor and the list goes on. But the idea that you can, you know, conduct these studies, take your findings, put pressure on the government, and hope for legislation. So asking the government to throw money at the problem. The political party is formed in 1912, you know, other, otherwise known as the Bull Moose Party, because, you know, Theodore Roosevelt referred to himself, he was like a bull moose at the convention, right? But it splits the Republican Party, which allows in 1912 Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, to be elected to the presidency because uh, um, Theodore Roosevelt threw his hat back in the ring to run for president um, against William Howard Taft another Republican. And so um, some Republicans, as we know what happens when a party splits, some Republicans go with Taft and others will go what they consider to be the more progressive route with Teddy Roosevelt. Nonetheless, the progressives as a political party virtually disappear by 1920. So when we're looking at social reform and, you know, again, I'm emphasizing the work of the Women's Christian Temperance Union with respect to, you know, temperance and the abolition of alcohol. Um, and, and then you get this intersection, right, that comes in the form of suffrage, all right, those women who will take up that mantle of suffrage. I often explain um, to the students under my instruction, whether it's women's history or United States history, when we're looking at progressivism, that it's good to kind of visualize social reform as an umbrella, okay? And you have all of these droplets, all of these different areas. And I would certainly contend that not all progressives are universally on board to every aspect of reform or consider every particular area. Um, uh, and what I mean by that is just because I am advocating, you know, for factory safety, that does not necessarily mean that I am a proponent of suffrage. OK, just because I am advocating for suffrage, I may not be a proponent of compulsory education and the list goes on. OK, um, so uh, progressivism with respect to social reform is like this umbrella. And we have all of these droplets under uh, that umbrella because my definition of um, a social ill or social evil or something that needs reformed may not be the same as yours. And that takes us to the muckrakers. And oftentimes, of course, when we study those muckrakers, we are, you know, looking at people like um, uh, Ida B. Um, uh, I, um, uh, Ida Tarbell, excuse me, and the history of Standard Oil Corporation. Uh, we look at Lincoln Steffens and the shame of the cities. We look at Upton Sinclair and the jungle. And um, of course, the list goes on and on and on. I'm introducing you uh, to two in particular here that are directly related to uh, the patent medicine industry, the crusade against it, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They understood clearly the need to pull the Women's Christian Temperance Union into this issue. And um, that, of course, is um, Edward, Edward Bach, who publishes in the Ladies' Home Journal, The Patent Medicine Curse in 1904. And then Samuel Adams, uh, it's Samuel Hopkins Adams, um, who publishes in Collier's Magazine, The Great American Fraud in 1905. Um, so I, I just want to uh, share a brief excerpt with you in uh, concerning some quotes from 
them and their writing. Um, Edward Bach said this, a burden rests on the Women's Christian Temperance Union and not enough work has been done. A campaign lies before the organization and it has not met its obligation by any means. He published the scathing editorial called The Patent Medicine Curse. And he said, I quote, hundreds of the most zealous members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union living on farms and in small communities are allowing the advertisements of these alcohol-filled remedies to be painted on their fences, on their barns, sides of houses and buildings. Fox criticism went even further, pointing out the contradiction that existed with the religious press as well, where the Women's Christian Temperance Union published on a regular basis official news of its organization and its respective branches. Bach handed over in a fury his condemnations of the patent medicine industry and those associated with it, and I quote, the mixtures containing these drugs, alcohol, opium, and cocaine are freely taken by people who would be outraged at the very going into a saloon and ordering a glass of whiskey. All those who have reared children know the effect which is immediately felt by the child through the mother's milk if she takes comparatively simple remedies for the sake of saving a physician's fee, they pour into their mouths and into their systems a quantity of unknown drugs which have in them percentages of alcohol, cocaine, opium that are absolutely alarming. A mother who would hold up her hands in holy horror at the thought of her child drinking a glass of beer which contains from two to 5% of alcohol say absolutely nothing of opium and cocaine. So this editorial is a rallying cry. Now he publishes this list from the Massachusetts State Board um, uh, Analyst of the Alcohol and Patent Medicines. And as you can see, he names them here. He, he includes a list, Parker's Tonic, um, Green's Nervosa Pruritana, the list goes on, right? Um, and, and a number of bitters. Uh, now, he's sued because of this, the inclusion of the chart, um, uh, because it was an outdated um, uh, Massachusetts board report and it was inaccurate. So it cost the Ladies Home Journal a liable suit, um, but for Bach, it was a mere hiccup in his campaign because he went forward full steam ahead um, and feverishly pursued um, uh, his mission. Uh, Samuel Hopkins, um, uh, Samuel Ho Hopkins Adams, on the other hand, he published a series of articles in Collier's Magazine under the title, The Great American Fraud. Um, and so what he started to do was, you know, really look at references to the wording itself, bitters, tonic, and the list goes on. And he says that, you know, it's misleading for this reason. And I quote, a large number of the so-called tonics are only cocktails in disguise. And that many of these nostrums are directly responsible for the making of drunkards and drug fiends. Adam's strategy of selecting a medicine, analyzing it, studying its advertising and the claims set forth, and then collecting histories of the people who used it was most effective in convincing the public that they were gullible and severely misled. Um, and of course, this is what takes us to the fact that they also show pictures of Lydia Pinkham's grave, uh, her tombstone, um, to show that they are being misled by um, uh, the replies. Uh, the consumers and women in particular are being misled by the replies from Lydia Pinkham because she had been long dead and gone. So that takes us to the response of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, it is really under the, uh, the leadership of Ella Eaton Kellogg, as uh, pictured here. 
um, she was a dietitian and she had uh, really been progressive. And, you know, certainly she was progressive um, with respect to looking at food and drug safety issues, um, certainly looking at nutrition from a much more progressive um, perspective. Um, and she was really interested in the root causes of health issues and found that the lack of general health and wellness really, you know, played a role. And so I'm going to read you this verbatim. People who had any sort of ailment, be it physical or mental, turned to alcohol and drugs, according to Kellogg. The problem was essentially a cycle. The food that was widely available was unsafe. It had little to no nutritious value and was made with unsafe ingredients. In response, people would take stimulants, tonics, bitters, other substances, so they would have the energy to continue to function. So once you get, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union really taking up this mantle and starting to reject the patent medicine industry, understand that there is this whole other, you know, kind of area that is a consequence that I certainly don't have time to get into here tonight. And it is another area of research and study, but that's the, the, the politics and the press of the situation. You have to keep in mind that there are, of course, millions of dollars in advertising. Um, and so, you know, uh, certainly the politicians are coming on and saying, you know, look, um, the, the, the the press is is the the um, uh, uh, the press is concerned that they're going to be losing all these advertising dollars. So you really need to kind of step back this crusade. Um, so, you know, here we have uh, a lot of um, uh, debate and controversy, um, not to mention political maneuvering, which is a topic in and of itself with respect to patent medicine and um, advertising. But for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, certainly by, you know, 1908-1909, um, a report from the annual convention showed that certain states were really willing to reference the patent medicine industry. Um, and this is an excerpt from the Maryland um, state report. An encouraging number of physicians do not prescribe alcoholics. Increased desire among women to know what medicines to avoid. 20 demonstrations by burning the alcohol in patent medicines. There's great interest in this can be done by heating the medicine in a granite spoon over a candle and setting fire to the alcohol as it evaporates. This shows how tests can be made at home. In that same annual report, the Florida Union conveyed that their members protested against patent medicine advertising with good results, while California reported that five newspapers actually refused patent medicine advertising. So uh, what the Women's Christian Temperance Union does, certainly prompted by this very aggressive um, uh, muckraking activity on the part of um, uh, journalists like Edward Bach, um, is they distribute more than 20,000 pamphlets to visit physicians adv advocating non-alcoholic medicines. Um, and it allows, you know, of course, the tide to turn a bit. And so now that you have this new attention and tremendous <laughs> emphasis played on impure uh, medicines, states themselves begin to pass legislation for drug companies to list the ingredients of their respective medicines. And that really puts a dent in the industry, okay? And so ultimately, by 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act is passed. And um, as stated here, it's an act for preventing the manufacture, sale, or transportation of adulterated or misbranded or poisonous um, uh, delirious foods, drugs, medicines, and liquors, um, and for regulating traffic therein and for other purposes. And so that is really, um, you know, uh, what allows this tremendous boom uh, to go 
robust um, because certainly some of these medicines could just not survive because of their ingredients and also because of their misleading approach to advertising and marketing. In looking at um, just this one, you know, small area of study uh, um, with respect to the patent medicine industry, as I mentioned at the introduction, there's many other areas for consideration. Um, you know, we're looking at this, you know, kind of uh, these Victorian imagery of the middle class, uh, keeping in mind that we have this tremendous influx of immigration in the United States from between 1860 and 1920, you know, approximately 28.2 million immigrants coming into the United States from Southern and Eastern Europe. We also have, of course, matters very specific to race and the deeply entrenched racial um, divisions in the United States that are not touched upon at all um, in this presentation. The geography of the situation, how did approaches differ when we look at rural versus urban, east, west, north, south. There are geographic differences to take into consideration, not to mention socioeconomic position. Who could afford what? Yes, certainly, you know, if we look at uh, by the turn of the 20th century, um, an economist by the name of Thorstein Veblen publishes in 1899 the theory of the leisure class. And he is looking at the emergence of, you know, kind of this, this middle class. And uh, he coins this term conspicuous consumption, this, I, this desire for an outward expression of status um, and what that means for the lower classes who may want to up, uh, emulate the upper classes. So affordability, you know, that image of that beautiful piano in a Victorian home um, is not, <laughs> you know, certainly commonplace. Um, so we need to take that into consideration as well. And then when we think about it in the most modern sense, and I, you know, I write a little bit about this, um, our, 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 our changing um, attitudes based on a number of influences and perspectives towards drug addiction. Um, and, you know, certainly in the, throughout the 20th century, we can look at that according to race, gender, socioeconomic status, and so on. Um, but uh, one historian, Charles Whitebread, contends that between two and 5% of the entire population of the United States was addicted to drugs in uh, around 1900, um, most without even knowing it due to a lack of medical knowledge, due to the gullibility um, of, uh, you know, Americans that are, um, you know, kind of misled by patent medicine advertising and so on. Um, and so uh, we don't often think about this, you know, middle to upper class Victorian woman being a drug addict, but while she can't go to the saloon, nothing prevents her from sitting in her parlor and putting a couple uh, drops, if not a teaspoonful of two or two of bitters in her tea um, and sipping it slowly in the afternoon. So with that said, I am uh, happy to field any questions that anyone might have. And um, I have a bunch. Uh, I'll, I can read them or I can put them in the chat. Um, There's um, some of them. Yes. OK, one. Um, the first one that came in was from Susan Smith. Uh, did many people get addicted to the tonics with alcohol, morphine, opium, et cetera? Yes. I mean, that, that's what white bread's research shows um, that a very large a percentage were unknowingly addicted. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I know that, that he is one of the um, uh, preeminent uh, areas, uh, uh, preeminent researchers in that particular area um, of uh, 19th century addictions. Keeping in mind too, I didn't mention anything. I do, I, I do address this um, um, in one of the chapters, but uh, um, morphine um, 
makes its way into the mainstream as a direct consequence of the American Civil War. The American Civil War is, of course, the, the, the first war where morphine is used on the battlefield. Soldiers' disease is an addiction to morphine um, from veterans of the American Civil War. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's used regularly and then adopted and adapted by the patent medicine industry. So, yes, addiction it's probably more common than we would think. And then there's a, an interesting question from Barbara Burston. What evidence do you have of the activities and strength of the WCTU in the Pittsburgh area? Have you been well, able to that's unearth one that? area I haven't, I haven't, I've been looking at, you know, kind of the most, the, the much broader, that's an excellent question. Um, and I didn't look very specifically to um, uh, the Pittsburgh chapters of the organization. I was looking at a, you know, kind of much broader response at the national level. Um, but that's certainly an area that I would like to research and learn more about um, specifically uh, because of course, it is um, a Pittsburgh drugstore that prompted my interest in this topic. So there's a series of comments and questions from Philomena D. Um, let me just read through them and see what you think. Um, I always thought the WCTU was focused on bars and saloons and men drinking their paychecks and leaving wives and children impoverished. But the WCTU was also against alcohol content in patent medicines, the question. And yes. it's the muckrakers who alerted them to it. Um, and then well, we just, uh, uh, okay. And then she questions is two to 5% of the population were addicted to drugs in 1900. Do we know the percentage today? <laughs> wow. Uh, yes, I, I, I do not. Um, I think that one of my colleagues is on this call who I will not put on the spot. Um, uh, but she, um, her area is drug and alcohol. So she may put it in the chat. Um, if she is still on here, I think I saw her on here earlier. So she might have a comment on that since her area is, is, is um, drug and alcohol. Um, I want to go back, Steffi, if it's okay for one moment, but I think that is the one thing I, I wanted to emphasize when we look at the intersection of uh, the various, you know, kind of um, areas of activism, because that point that Philomena made, um, uh, thank you, Dr. English, I see that you put it in the chat as I uh, was hoping that you would. Um, uh, I, I, Philomena's point that, you know, you think of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, you know, and it starts with the Anti-Saloon League, the Anti-Saloon League, which precedes the Women's Christian Temperance Union. This idea that, you know, alcohol is indeed a social evil um, that um, uh, unfortunately due to uh, the very difficult and in some instances, horrific working conditions, uh, the very, very long hours, because there is no such thing as an eight hour workday where men are working 12, you know, 16, in some instances, as we know, in the steel industry, a 24 hour shift, um, they're going to hit the local saloon on their way home. And it's that's kind of a two prong, you know, problem there, because not only are they going to consume their wages, but they're going to become drunk. And then when they go home, they're going to take out their frustrations on their wives and children. And so they're talking about domestic abuse and child abuse without using using that terminology, um, you know, much earlier than, of course, you know, in, in the vein that we look at it now. So that's a really good point about the activities. But certainly, yes, they, uh, they redirected and um, uh, certainly were quite energized um, as a response to uh, those calling for reform in the patent medicine industry. Thank you. So Jacqueline, uh, for your splendid uh, presentation this evening. It's really been enlightening to me. I'll tell you, the, uh, I'm, I was I'm glad that you didn't mention anything in the Victorian era about uh, the problem with uh, ladies' vapors, the vapors. Remember, <laughs> that was considered a, a malady of some sort. I, I, but uh, you, you're. Well 
certainly if you look at the advertisements and you look at the long list of things, of course, um, that can be treated, uh, either real or imagined, um, you know, uh, by, by no stretch is this, of course, exhaustive with respect to um, uh, the ills and the, you know, the ills and the ailments. Right. And you, got some, okay. you mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, Steffi, I just want to one follow up. You mentioned of Thorsten Veblen. I'm a student of Thorsten Veblen's long overdue for uh, recognition well past his time. But uh, he, he came up with another concept, uh, the, uh, something called, uh, 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 oh, geez, I just blew, <laughs> just evaporated on my head, uh, pecuniary emulation, peculiarity emulation next to uh, conspicuous consumption was <laughs> another way of uh, saying keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the Joneses. Right, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. I'm glad you touched on that. Thank you. So I put a, I put a question in the chat to, to you uh, from Celia Baker that she that, had put. That I see that, and that is, you know, did any babies die? I mean, I, I you know, that is certainly an absolutely um, a common question anytime that, you know, I have a discussion with anyone concerning um, uh, the admin administration of these drugs um, to children and newborns. And, um, you know, while there are not accurate numbers, you know, there are wide ranging estimates because certainly the medical knowledge is not there to determine the cause of death. And so even though the child, you know, let's say for example, the child is crying and it's because they think the baby's teething or has colic or whatever, and then they administer the patent medicine. And then the next morning, of course, you know, the baby unfortunately is dead. And so, you know, the assumption may very well be based on limited medical knowledge that whatever was the underlying cause of the baby being ill. It might not have been a child teething um, or consequences of teething or something else. And that would be the cause of death, not the patent medicine itself, not the overdosing of the child. So it's really difficult to ascertain what those numbers would be. But of course, you know, I would suggest that, I mean, we could probably conclude that yes, the answer to that question would be um, absolutely yes with respect to mortality rates. There are some really interesting comments, I wouldn't call them questions, from Leslie Prusbillick and Marsha Waldstriker and Aaron Hoffman, who, are, and I'm copying this down, so I'm going to um, uh, give it to you, send it to you, Jackie, because it's information. I don't know if you want... Uh, well, Aaron is um, one of my wonderful colleagues from CCAC and a fellow uh, historian. Um, uh, he'll, we'll have to recruit him to do a program here for the Battle of Homestead Foundation as well. So, um, Aaron, did you have something to add? No, I just added some interesting comments rather than questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Jackie, I'm wondering whether there were any governmental or even religious organizations involved in trying to help the women who became addicted after it became clear that there was an addiction problem. What, if anything, was done to help them through that? Well, I, you know, I certainly have not delved deeply into that area of, of research, meaning the consequences of the addiction. Um, uh, my research has not gone in that direction, so I do not have a definitive answer for you. I would suggest, however, that under, you know, if you think about this umbrella of progressivism and, you know, um, treatment, and I use that term loosely, um, and perspectives, attitudes towards those who are concern, uh, considered to be addicts. Remember, you know, it's considered to be some level of a personal failing, right? Um, and there must be something, you know, there's a deficiency. Maybe this woman who looks good on the surface isn't so good after all, um, if she's fallen victim to addiction. So, um, you know, it's if you think of Victorian literature, you know, what is typically the ending of Vic in Victorian? What, how does the Victorian woman, the bad woman, the not so good woman, how does 
she, you know, meet her demise is a, a common theme um, in Victorian literature. So, you know, unfortunately, attitudes and 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 perspectives are, you know, certainly not advanced in that regard um, when we think of those that um, had fallen victim to um, addiction. Uh, one quick short question before we get to uh, back to Suzanne to close, which is uh, from Marsh uh, Marshy Wallstriker. Where does laudanum come into play? So the one. Well, yeah, that that's a really good that's a really good um, uh, question. Um, could is Marsha still on? I am. Okay, so um, what did you, could you elaborate just a little bit or be a little bit more specific? Um, well, I was just wondering, laudanum as a quote unquote prescription drug that was mostly used for women, that, that as far as my studies tell me, um, was one of the first times when the concept of in the Victorian era, the concept of be, women being addicted, um, that they actually knew it and they, that, that, that society was aware of it. And the women themselves also knew they were addicted, which is where a lot of, lot of those, those, those stories come from. Because in this case, what you're talking about is they didn't know, but here we have something that is well known, but they're still advertising. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, um, I think there's a tremendous correlation that we have to make here. Um, and uh, I, I did um, uh, speak to this, albeit briefly, um, uh, when I did uh, talk with Amanda at the city paper. Uh, and that is, you know, this, if we think of modern advertising, and I, I made the comment in that piece that, you know, where I said, of course, if you look on television today, every other advertisement is, it seems, for some type of drug, for some type of medicine. Um, and, you know, I, unfortunately, Marsha would have to, you know, um, uh, agree that, you know, when we when we look at you know the 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 situation over the course of the 20th century thinking about what knowledge is available and the realization of of, of what is addicted addictive and what certainly you know um has uh tremendous consequences or, or repercussions in the form of side effects um and then uh you know this desire to kind of keep it going and keep the money flowing and you know it's keep an inherently american issue i believe when yeah. uh, when europeans come to the u.s and they see the ads on TV and all the ads inside the magazines, they're dumbfounded. Yeah. It's, all, it's a very inherently American thing, so I'm not surprised. So I think we're, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Um, there's certainly a lot left to discuss and it was super interesting. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you, um, Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Well, it was wonderful. I'm going to just give you a couple of pieces of information before I let you go here. And that is, um, this, as I mentioned earlier, was our first monthly program of 2021 season, our program series. And our next one is going to take place on Sunday, April 18th at 3 o'clock p.m., when we will join with the steelworkers, the United Steelworkers, for the annual Bernard Kleiman Lecture. This year's presentation is called Whitewashing Andrew Carnegie and will feature Dr. Sarah Papazaglottis as she discusses how he used philanthropic support for the Carnegie Museums and the Carnegie Library as a way to whitewash his reputation. Um, holding out these institutions is places where the working people could go and improve themselves or men, um, even as he was imposing working conditions that made it impossible for the workers to experience the leisure time necessary to enjoy the libraries and museums. 
And the program is also going to include current employees from the Carnegie Museum, Carnegie Library, who have recently voted for and won union representation. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that program. Always, always a good program, the Bernard Kleiman lecture with the steel workers. Just one other to mention, and that is our May program, May 21st, 2021. We're gonna bring you author Gabriel Wynick to discuss his new work called The Next Shift, The Fall of Industry and the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America. And you may have been seeing some coverage of this book, including a piece in the New York Times. We're gonna be quite lucky to have um, Gabe Wynant speak to us, May 21st, 2021. I'd like to ask you to look at our website for future programs. I'm not gonna go through them now. That again, site is battleofhomestead.org. There you can learn about the monthly programs and you'll also be able to access several of our prior programs, including Charlie's Monday Markers. This is a series of short videos that feature historian Charlie McAllister as he shares with us the stories behind the many labor history markers that are throughout our region. Um, last but not least, you'll wanna check out our uh, oh, very own Essential Work podcast, which is dedicated to discussing the past, present, and future of work. The podcast, which is directed by Nathan Ruggles, always includes a level of information that you won't find anywhere else, that whether it's critically important environmental issues that are brought to you by Dr. Patricia DeMarco and her guests, or labor news as considered by union activist Rosemary Trump and historian Charlie McAllister. You can find the Essential Work podcast wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. Now, as a practical matter, this and all of our other programs take money to produce. Our ideas are endless, but the money is not. And we invite you to make a donation today or any other day by going to the website, clicking on the donate button. And of course, please consider becoming a member of the Battle of Homestead Foundation to keep this important work going. So again, Dr. Cavalier, thank you for a fantastic program and thank you all for attending. It was really a pleasure to have you. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank you everyone for staying um, for the duration. And I put my email in the chat if anybody would like to contact me with additional questions. I should have done that earlier, I apologize.